morning, everyone. Welcome to the 2020 virtual edition of the University of Guanajuato Academic Collaboration Forum and Expo. My name is Elias Ledesma. I am head of the International Relations and Academic Collaboration Office for the University of Guanajuato. It's a pleasure and an honor to start the forum activities with the presentation of our first speaker, Francisco Marmolejo. Since February 2020, Francisco Marmolejo works as an education advisor of Qatar Foundation in Qatar, providing support and advice towards the improvement of the overall education strategy of Qatar Foundation and its unique ecosystem of innovative education. Previously, from 2012 to 2020, he worked at the World Bank, where he served as a global higher education lead based in Washington, D.C., and more recently as lead higher education specialist for India and South Asia based in Delhi. From 1995 to 2002, he served as funding executive director of the Consortium for North American Higher Education Collaboration, a network of more than 160 universities, mainly from USA and Mexico, based in the University of Arizona, where he also worked as a system vice president, affiliate researcher at the Center of the Study of Higher Education and affiliate faculty at the Center for Latin American Studies. He has been American Council of On Education Fellow at the University of Massachusetts, academic vice president of the University of the Americas in Mexico, and international consultant at OECD in Paris. Francisco Marmolejo has received honorary doctorate degrees from his alma mater, the University of San Luis Potosí and the University of Guadalajara, both in Mexico. Francisco, again, it's a pleasure that you are here in the University of Guanajuato. Go ahead. University of Guanajuato, and uh, so knowing that uh, this year um, the gathering uh, that uh, traditionally the university has in place uh, on a face-to-face -face format has to be transitioned to virtual is of course uh, one of the examples of uh, the need to um, adapt uh, our higher education uh, activities and of course our internationalization activities. So again, thank you very much, Elias and Eric, for the kind invitation to, to share some perspectives. And today I'm connecting from the opposite side of the world, even though I would like to be in Guanajuato, or to be more precisely in, uh, in Ojuelos, Jalisco, my hometown, which is very close to the city of Guanajuato. But now I'm connecting from Doha, since, uh, where I have been since uh, the, uh, the lockdown and uh, the beginning of the pandemic. So, uh, the idea is to speak a little bit about, uh, you know, how higher education has to adapt in this uh, completely different world in which we live, and in which way uh, internationalization and the internationalization agenda, you know, should be also adapted and I might say reinvented. So I think it might be important to do that by doing a SWOT analysis, and and uh, this is something that it helps us to have a better sense of, again, what are the big challenges that we face, but at the same time, what are the most significant opportunities that we face uh, in trying to reimagine internationalization of higher education. And in doing a SWOT, a SWOT analysis, I think it might be very important to, first of all, for each of the attendees, to try to define themselves what is the type of approach that they have towards internationalization in their respective institutions. Um, you know, because we have the case of universities in which internationalization is merely, I might say, a symbolic activity. It is an activity that is much more on the margins of the institution. It is an activity that uh, 
in a way, um, you know, it, it follows a very uh, sort of a traditional pattern that the second type of institution in which you have um, a, an institution that has some level of activity in, ter in internationalization, but that devotes uh, the activity mostly uh, to the traditional approaches, you know, the signing of MOUs, the uh, attracting uh, or sending students, uh, you know, it's much more that type of traditional approach. The first one is symbolic. It is just, uh, again, just a small office with not too much activity. The second one is much more the traditional approach. Then you have the case of universities that have already ventured to do something else, to go beyond the mobility of students, and which are much more comprehensive in the type of internationalization activities. And of course, also, you have a few cases of institutions that are really disruptive, that are trying to uh, create completely new approaches, again, disruptive, revolutionary approaches in internationalization of higher education. So I think in order to do a SWOT analysis, it is very important for people listening to see where do they see their respective institutions? Is this a, a university which uh, agenda is Again, symbolic, traditional, comprehensive, or disruptive. Because based on that, is that we can identify what are the strengths, the weaknesses, and of course, the opportunities and threats that we face in international higher education. So talking about strengths might be important to, of course, make the point that the significant strength we have in international higher education is that international education matters, especially in today's world, which is increasingly globalized, which is increasingly interconnected, we cannot conceive, you know, people with education without the global perspective on their preparation. So that's why international education major strength is the fact that is highly needed in today and also will be highly needed in tomorrow's world. Of course, the other reason is because widening understanding of complexities and new skills for jobs of the future, it is something that, again, is highly sustained by um, internationalization of higher education. You know, when we see the type of jobs, the type of skills that are going to be needed for the future, for the after pandemic world, there is no doubt that those skills are strengthened, are supported by international education. We also know that internationalization and international education is a vehicle for impactful international presence of universities. And of course, also, you know, international education is a source of prestige, positioning in the rankings, and also, of course, in some cases, a source of additional resources for institutions. So those are the strengths that international education has, regardless of the type of focus that a university has towards its internationalization agenda. But in terms of weaknesses, and I think the pandemic has been telling us this, there is no doubt that it looks like sort of the international education agenda, it has been based in a relatively naive vision of the world. So the assumption is that magically something happens when people are receiving education that will transform them and that that transformation is gonna result in a better world. This is more or less the kind of naive assumption that we have about international education. But we don't have the evidence to demonstrate that that is the case. That is not just an anecdotal reference, but that is a real, a, you know, a sort of a correlation, I might say, between the educational intervention in, in uh, international education and what it will result in the preparation of the students of today, graduates of tomorrow. And of course, in today's world, during the crisis, some of those assumptions about internationalization are being challenged. You know, for instance, traditionally we assumed, again, our framework reference was that people with an open mind um, consequently will become a multicultural, tolerant and well-informed citizen. And of course, that this will result in societies more interconnected. 
And of course, that also this is going to increase the collective economic and social welfare. And also that this will lead to more equal societies. And of course, this will lead to a borderless world. Well, the crisis is telling us that despite some of those factors, it looks like we are not getting into that ideal world. That even the case of what we called open-minded individuals, still they don't have the multicultural and tolerant perspective that is needed in today's world. And we see the cases of many institutions, many countries, I'm sorry, where even you know, people in government, which are in theory highly educated, don't convey that agenda. And this is leading us to a world which is not as inclusive and as beautiful, I might say, as we envision in international education. Again, this relatively naive, relatively romantic view of the world as it is a better world thanks to international education is today being challenged, being threatened. And of course, one of the, cha the problems is that internationalization as such is a concept that not everybody understands, that not everybody has a good sense of what is and what is not. Um, and of course, the, the question is who should be blamed for that? They, the ones who don't understand what internationalization is, or we, which are in charge of internationalization, that probably we have been unable to properly indicate and to properly explain and to properly clarify what is and what is not internationalization. So a good example of this is uh, this uh, dissonance that I find really intriguing. Governments usually in the rhetorical side, in the rhetoric, they used to say that they value international education. But when you ask, and this is part of a, a study that we conducted when I was working at the World Bank. Uh, when you ask decision makers about what should be the priorities in higher education, it looks like internationalization is not precisely on the top of the agenda. It is being seen as kind of a lower part of the priorities. So it looks like, again, from the good ideas to the concrete decisions about where to focus the emphasis in this case of governments, internationalization not always is on the horizon as one of the priorities to pay attention to. And the same happened at the institutional level. For instance, during the crisis, this survey conducted with presidents of universities and colleges in the United States from April to July, it shows you where are the priorities of the presidents of the institutions. They are concerned in April, for instance, they were concerned in May about if they were going to have students during the fall. They were concerned about the long-term viability of the institution. You know, in April, of course, it was a very similar uh, kind of concern. By June, priorities again still were like that. And interestingly, in July, the key priority of presidents of universities is how to handle the safety protocols in order to be able to continue operations in higher education. And where is internationalization there? Well, it is at the lower level, again, of the priorities. And this is one of the reasons why sometimes the problem is that we are not properly conveying what is internationalization and how internationalization will contribute to meet the demands of the changing higher education, which is the main topic of this conference and of this fair at the University of Guanajuato. Some of the typical misconceptions that many times the people working in international education contribute to prolong, contribute to create, is that internationalization is mobility, and that is mobility of people, mostly students and faculty members that internationalization is also connected to the idea of the prestige and also again thinking about that rankings is a synonym of international well-being of an institution and of course of quality. Another misconception is that the signing of memorandum of understandings is a synonym of international activity. The more international agreements we have, the more international is our university. And I think that is exactly the opposite. 
Even I joke by saying that the degree of internationalization of a university is inversely proportional to the number of MOUs that it has signed. And of course, there is also another misconception that internationalization is something that you achieve by decree, that by decision of the authority of the institution, and that of course, that is gonna be magically gonna result in becoming a global university. Another misconception is that internationalization is also a uh, basically a source of additional resource for the institutions. And of course, in some cases, we can see that right now, this is becoming a significant challenge. Why those misconceptions are wrong? Well, you know, talking about student mobility, you know very well that despite the efforts to increase student mobility, the significant, I might say, the overwhelming majority of students don't have the opportunity to, ex to enjoy physical mobility abroad. Consequently, if we concentrate our efforts only on that very tiny, relatively insignificant percentage of the total enrollment, we truly are missing the point about why internationalization should matter. And of course, some of the hints are that there is traditionally a narrow interpretation on what is and what is not international education. Another hint of the problems with internationalization is that, of course, there are different rationales for pushing internationalization. In some cases, it might be political, in others, it's diplomatic, in others, it's just for the purposes of academics, uh, academic improvement, and in some cases, it's because money. Of course, another hint of the problems we have is that also there are some people expressing concern about the negative connotations of internationalization. You know, issues such as neocolonialism, brain drain, loss of identity, and others are some of the concerns that people in higher education, you know, this, is, uh, it, this can be seen on the survey conducted by the International Association of Universities, indicating decision makers that internationalization is not as good as we would like to make the point about it. So we need to be very mindful of the fact that despite the strengths of international education in today's world, there are significant also limitations or weaknesses that we need to address. And of course, in terms of threats, definitively the major threat that we are facing in international education today is the fact that we have the pandemic. And the pandemic, not only from the sanitary from the health from the health perspective but also the fact that it is also something that has significant implications beyond just the pandemic from the uh, you know a uh, sanitary standpoint you know let's look at for instance the economic impact that the pandemic is having and we know that you know the scale of the downturn that the world is facing from an economic standpoint is worse that any recession in 150 years, all economies in the world, with the exception of China, will experience significant economic um, sort of deficit, economic uh, decrease in the activity in the, in the GDP. Uh, in some countries, it's gonna be terrible. You know, the India case, 24%. Mexico is also a country which is gonna experience a significant economic setback even the United States as well. Again, China is the only country that will experience a positive economic growth. And of course, if we translate that to education and more specifically into international education, that the pandemic has resulted in something that we never imagined. More than 200 million students not being able to go to college, about 70% of international students having to go back home, and of course, 30% staying in countries, in many cases, facing difficult situations. And of course, the transition to the continuation of teaching has not been as smooth as we could imagine because only 66% of students globally are being able to continue in some way education thanks to technology, which means that about, again, a significant 40%, uh, a little bit less than that, 40% of students are not being able to continue education in a normal way. So 
What are the short-term implications of this problem? Well, the first one is that we like it or not, the economic contraction will represent fewer resources for the economies, the families, the government, and of course, the universities. You know, all universities in the world are facing this significant challenge. The second significant implication is that fewer students will come to colleges and universities. And many students will have to make a decision about continuation of their students, their studies in the future. Another complication is that there will not be international students on campus. And of course, still today, there are many institutions that are even not sure if they are gonna be able to continue education in a formal way, or they will have to continue teaching remotely as it is happening in the case of the Mexican universities. So the trend towards increased mobility of students in the world has been suddenly stopped and it will be stopped at least for one year, you know, one semester, one year. In some cases, we see predictions about even two years of some level of recovery in the student mobility. So if our institution has been focusing its international education work in mobility, I think we are in big problem because that means that the reason of our existence, if you want, is no longer available. Do we have the luxury of the university paying our salary with no activity for two years? Probably, probably not. Do we need to reinvent in order to meet the new demands of higher education? We should, otherwise we won't have a reason to exist in our colleges and universities. So students, again, are deciding not to go abroad, in some cases even canceling their plans, you know, a good example of how this is transitioning is by checking what is the popularity of terms in Google. And of course, the term, um, you know, online courses was not popular, let's say in uh, January, and it became one of the most popular terms in Google. The term study abroad, which was very popular, literally disappeared from the map at a certain point in the month of, uh, in the month of April. And again, not too many international students will be, will be the horizon, at least in the short term. This is, for instance, an analysis conducted by the World Trade Organization that shows very clearly that between 50 and 75 percent of students will not go abroad. And of course, for some countries, it's a big problem. Look at the case of Australia, which usually you know, used to be fed by mostly Chinese and Indian students. And today, what are the implications of that? Well, in some cases, universities are heading to close campus because they were relying mostly on the fees being paid by international students. And if international students are not coming, then not only the Office of International Education, but the entire campus has to be closed. Look at the case of the UK where also a survey conducted by the British Council shows very clearly that many students are likely to cancel or delay their plans, in this case, the students coming from Asia. Look at the case of the United States, where even though 67% of students intending to go to the US still consider a big priority, at the same time, institutions, both at the graduate and undergraduate level are accepting that they will have fewer international students in the short term. And institutions are desperately trying to attract those students, fighting furiously for those students, even flexibilizing the way that they used to accept students. Can you imagine about a year ago that institutions will for, you know, avoid having to do any testing such as GRV or GM, GM, uh, you know, GMAT in order to accept international students? Well, now they are doing that. And this is something that basically shows, you know, the impact of this. So in the short term, there are some lessons learned that we should keep in consideration. The first one is that we didn't have enough planning. We were not prepared for the crisis, both in higher education and more specifically in international education. Second, that the fragile environment in which we work is very fragile, much more than we imagine. That online education is a good idea, but is not the solution 
is not the permanent solution to the problems, that we need a type of leadership which is different for the crisis to the leadership that is the common one for the typical times. And of course, that, that many of the significant limitations, inadequacies that I was referring to on international higher education have become more explicit and more critical during the pandemic. And that many of the assumptions that we used to have about international education are also being challenged today. So uncertainty is something that it is the new rule, it is the new norm. And that uncertainty applies, of course, to international higher education. So expectations of institutions, for instance, in the United States about decreasing enrollment and consequently decreasing international enrollment are a reality. The great overwhelming majority of institutions are experiencing fewer students and fewer international students. And even just in general, the case of Mexico, for instance, in the case of private universities, they are expecting to have a reduced enrollment of about 30%. So that is, of course, a significant challenge. And institutions are furiously trying to resolve the problems. And again, paying attention to what I say, the urgent, but forgetting about the important. And many of them are canceling study our programs, limiting student traveling. Those are the realities, of course, that we are gonna be facing again, just in the short term. So what are the potential consequences of all this situation? Well, that since there will be fewer students, since that, those students have a multiplier effect, since there are significant financial implications or realities that institutions are facing, there is the risk that interest on international education may be diminished. And that consequently, the work of people in international education may be marginalized. So offices of international education, unless we do something, may become just part of the periphery, may become just part of the marginal in some, and in some cases may be dramatically reduced in scope or even closed eventually, as we are seeing in many cases in different parts of the world. So we like it or not, this is a new reality. And it's a new reality that we like it or not, we also need to see with different lenses. The new normal is different. About six months ago, we could not imagine that a stadium in South Korea will be filled just with pictures of the fans, or that a church in Italy was gonna be filled also with pictures of uh, the parishioners, or that you know, religious places such as uh, Mecca, uh, which usually we have the image of that place completely crowded, it will be suddenly become a completely empty space. Or that a restaurant in Thailand will have these barriers to separate the, a, uh, the, the customers. Or even that, you know, the signaling of a street in consideration of social distancing will change. Or that schools in China will have these barriers also between students. Or that teaching will have to be back to just um, you know, delivery through TV, or that students will have to face the reality by being inventive in creating their own masks, or that they will have to go to the streets, to the streets, or go to the, you know, the roads in order to have access to the internet. Those are some of the realities of today's world. Universities that used to be that place which is completely crowded, that is very lively, that students are mingling all the time, suddenly also became empty spaces with no souls, no students, virtual commencements. Or could you imagine even the case of a university, let's say in China, that uh, will use robots for their commencement. So of course, the new social life on campus will be completely different as we enter into this new world, into this new normal. And of course, not all is bad, because also this provides a unique opportunity to reinvent and reimagine international education. Uh, if we look at the future, 
the future of international education, I think it is important to recognize that this renewed landscape for higher education and for internationalization, it is a unique opportunity because it is time to rethink the role that international education places in this world that is going to be, again, much more complicated, much more convoluted, and of course, much more complex. It is time to challenge our assumptions. Who told us that internationalization is just about mobility? That, you know, do we really know if internationalization experience impacts the life of the students? Are rankings as important as we think? How outdated is our academic programs and our, you know, curriculum in our higher education institutions? What is education about? Is just about preparing for jobs or is preparing for life and citizenship. So those are some of the challenges that we need to, again, question, some of the issues that we need to question in international education. This is a time for new leadership in higher education and in international education. I think we need leaders in international higher education, which of course are ambitious, but also are much more inspirational and which are willing to take risks and also to challenge the traditional assumptions. And of course, there are many possibilities. And I can tell you about some of the things that I can see in the world today in which, in which internationalization is being reinvented. You know, many institutions are truly questioning those assumptions and they are reestablishing, reimagining, or again, revising their strategic plan for internationalization based on this new reality. The assumptions of previous plans for internationalization no longer work. We need to reinvent them based on the new realities. Of course, we need to redefine how do we organize the work of international in our um, higher education institutions? Do the organizational arrangement we have really respond to that? or we need to rearrange, we need to reaccommodate the different pieces and of course the different units in international in our offices. Do we need to revise, of course, the type of partnerships that we have, the type of engagements we have, and to use the ones that really are strategically important and also the ones in which also there is a win-win situation. Not only we benefit, but also our partners benefit from that. And of course, this is also a time to review the type of incentives that we have in place because we need to have the limited incentives, um, you know, being positioned in the areas where we want to trigger the type of response that it is going to be meaningful for our institutions. And of course, there are many options for consideration. You know, in the absence of mobility, we can do much more work in internationalization at home in efforts towards the providing of an international dimension, not to the one or two percent of our students, but to the hundred percent of our students. We can do much more in terms of virtual mobility in the absence of physical mobility. And there are many interesting efforts in Latin America in the COIL uh, format that are being in place right now in Mexico, uh, you know, Universidad Veracruzana, internationally through the Inter-American Association of Universities in Brazil to FAUBAI. So we see a good examples of virtual mobility at the institutional level um, that are, uh, again, an opportunity to be placed. You know, zero semester abroad for freshman students is something that we are seeing now as institutions are unable to bring physically their students. They are finding ways to provide them education staying at home at least for a semester. The creation or the establishing of micro campus as University of Arizona is doing in different parts of the world. The mirror code teaching, you know, the teaching with peer uh, faculty members from other institutions to students from the two campuses, thanks to Zoom, we can do that today in a very easy way. Uh, there are very innovative efforts of research collaboration that are happening right now that again, don't require the physical presence or connection uh, between uh, researchers in which also, again, there is a, a significant room for growth on this. And of course, as I mentioned before, 
there are very innovative interinstitutional partnerships that are being established by institutions by challenging the traditional assumptions of what do we mean by uh, uh, international partnerships. And also, we find institutions that are taking the opportunity to redesign their academic programs, to take away from the academic programs those things that are not important, and to include a global dimension, which has been offered, again, thanks to the new means, and again, this is connected to internationalization at home, so they are taking the opportunity to redesign their academic programs in order to become much more responsive to the needs of the future. So those are some of the ideas that I'd like to, uh, to, to mention to you. Uh, there is an interesting case right now of, uh, of uh, a, uh, a, the Mexican Association of Universities in, in, in Mexico, uh, you know, Mexican Association of Universities, AMPEI, which is precisely launching, uh, I, I believe tomorrow, uh, is going to be launching the, um, the, the program for uh, curriculum internationalization as a joint effort between the U.S. and Mexico, being supported by the U.S. Embassy and, uh, and again, uh, and, and Santander Bank as well, Universia. And this is something that I think uh, it is an effort that we need to pay a lot of attention because this is the only way that we truly can benefit and we can uh, truly mainstream internationalization into the core work of our institutions. So this is uh, an area that I guess, um, you know, it is important to work on because again, in this uh, pandemic, in this new normal, we have a very small window of opportunity to mainstream internationalization into the core work of our institution. This is the only way that we can claim that, you know, the skills that are going to be needed for the future are skills in which international dimension, international preparedness, international preparation can be providing the ways to achieve those by the students. You know, just look at what happens with uh, the gap that exists between, uh, that is being perceived between employers and um, universities. When you take a look to that gap, you can see very clearly that very important topics such as integrity, reliability, flexibility, and of course, awareness of contemporary issues are some of the skills that we assume that can be acquired through the international dimension in the curriculum. So. My, my invitation to all of you is to make sure that we make the offices of international education more central to the core priorities of our institutions by showing that they can contribute, the work can contribute, the work on international can contribute towards a much more relevant curriculum of all the students. So if we make the point about the fact that this new reality will require preparing students with global awareness, that this requires strengthening our cooperation with other institutions, that we need to implement mechanisms for better understanding, awareness, and respect, and that this is a way to innovate, then we can say that internationalization is the response to do that. And of course, there are very concrete areas that can be uh, you know, uh, taking in consideration. But I'd like to make the point that nobody will speak on behalf of international education, but the people working on international education. So for people in international education, it is time to get out of the comfort zone. Otherwise, no job may exist in the future. And that of course means, you know, more effectively connecting the international agenda to the day-to-day -day, uh, priorities of the institutions. And of course, you need to make a stronger case, louder case about why internationalization matters, not as a goal, but as a means. And that means that, again, you need to take the driving seat because otherwise nobody will do it for you. So this is a unique momentum. It is again, some kind of alignment, if you want, of the planet. And of course, there is no magic formula. 
because what it may work in one case might not be the solution in other cases. So my question to all of you, as you are gonna be having this reflection during these days in the event at the University of Guanajuato is, you know, are you in international education just reacting to what is happening outside? Are you copying or emulating what others are doing? Are you proactively engaged in fostering change on the international agenda of your institutions and the way that the institution may respond to? Of course, the art of ambiguity will be to continue doing the same, but waiting different results. And let me tell you, if you do that, most likely what it will come is not gonna be the light at the end of the tunnel, but it's gonna be the train. So you better act in order to do something else. And I just will finish with uh, two quotes, one from Charles Darwin, who said that it is not the strongest of the species that survive, not even the most intelligent, but the one that is more responsive to change. And if something is common today, it's change. And we better adapt, we better become responsive to this new reality that we are facing in the world in higher education and in international education. Many years ago, almost 100 years ago, Paul Valeri said, the future, like everything else, is no longer what it used to be. The future is not something that you guess, that you extrapolate, it is something that you build. So it is time to build a better future for international higher education, because that's the way that we will build a better future for our students of today, graduates and citizens of the complex society of tomorrow. Thank you very much for your time, and I wish you a great success and a very good learning and sharing experience during these days of this event at the University of Guanajuato. Thank you, Francisco. We have some questions uh, around here, but I think you already answered that question. And um, however, there is a good one. Uh, how to convince the authorities of this new change when you were in the moment of convincing them about the roots of internationalization itself? Yeah, well, I agree. Yeah, go ahead, Francisco. No, I, and, I, and I think, Elias, um, I, I think we need to convince people uh, you know, people that are uninformed of what is and what is not international education by different means. I think the best argument we have and we should use is evidence. And this is something that unfortunately, we have not dedicated a lot of energy in the past. Um, you know, we can, we can, you know, share a lot of anecdotes. And I see that institutions are very good at that. They used to claim, for instance, you know, that, you know, X individual is now a famous uh, public figure, a, fam a famous, uh, you know, a individual, either in the business sector or in government. And he or she was a uh, student in, in our international education program years ago. Well, you know, this is a good evidence, but it is not enough. You know, we have the tools to do that because in universities, we have the opportunity to create the assessment tools and to use those assessment tools in order to gather the evidence about what we are to claiming about. Uh, so what is the best way to do that? Well, you know, the best way to do that is to gather data about what happens with the experience that are, the, the experience that uh, students on the international scene are being exposed to and in which way that experience is shaping the rest of their life, both academically, professionally, and also personally. So if we gather that evidence, of course we can make a much more convincing argument on why international education is important and will be important in the new normal. And again, anecdote is not enough. You know, hard evidence is important. And in order to do that, we need to create these assessment tools, and of course, we need to use those assessment tools. And if there is any place where those type of tools can be both designed, implemented, and evaluated, it's in universities. So I think we have the problem of not doing that, 
but also we have the solution. Thank you, Francisco. And one last question. You know, nowadays we have a new normality. Do you think we are going to have a new sense of a global citizenship with a new normality? Well, I think I might say yes and not. You know, it's, uh, I, I like to quote, I didn't do it today, um, an interesting uh, reflection from uh, Edgar Morin, who uh, precisely when he was analyzing what we see in the world today, he was expressing both hope and concern. And this is something that also I'd like to, to share with, uh, with the audience today. We find in one way hope. You know, we see that the pandemic is, uh, in a way, allowing societies to show solidarity, you know, the best of human beings and the best of, you know, extending the, the reach to others and also being helpful to the ones which are in more difficult situations. And of course, we must assume that people with international preparedness are able to see that not only, you know, in the local community, but also globally. But at the same time, sadly, you know, this uh, pandemic also is showing not only the positive, but also the negative. It is so, it's showing also the, you know, the miserable side, side, if you want, of human beings and even of governments and uh, people in government. And um, you see, for instance, you know, those countries in which you know, government is telling that they will not work with others to resolve the problem of the vaccination. Or countries that are even trying to steal knowledge from others in order just to, in a very selfish way, trying to resolve just their own problems, forgetting about the rest of the world. And this is also very sad, um, you know, very, very sad. This is also very dismaying, I might say. So again, but even despite those difficult uh, and negative, I might say, consequences of the current crisis in which we live, I think we should hope. And for us working in international education, always we should continue being the ones who have hope that by providing students an opportunity to understand the world, but also to never lose the connection with the local community, with their roots, we are doing their best in preparing them for a world which is going to be, again, much more complex, much more complicated, much more difficult, at least in the short term. We shouldn't lose that hope and that, um, that desire to have that type of uh, better world. And again, this is the only way that we will sort of sustain the idea that international education matters, again, not as a means, not as a goal, I'm sorry, but as a means towards, again, a better human um, connectedness and a better society. Thank you, Francisco. Well, again, we want to thank you for uh, your analysis, your speech about uh, the new world. And uh, today that we are far away, I think we feel that we are closer than ever. So thank you again, Francisco. Uh, My pleasure, uh, Elias, and I wish you the best in the, in the event. Thank you. Bravo. <laughs> gracias, gracias. Hasta luego. Hasta luego.